Hello, welcome to the Freeman Conversations. I'm Joe Bernd Oka, the online editor of the Freeman, and welcome to another edition of Power Women, our way of paying tribute to women who are not afraid to make a difference. And our guest today is someone who definitely was and is not afraid to make a difference. She was a journalist turned lawyer and corporate communications professional, and I'm sitting beside attorney Jeanette Hassan of the um, corporate communications manager of Cebu Holdings Incorporated. This is a subsidiary of Ayala Land. Yes. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning. Happy Good morning. Women's Month. Happy Women's Month to everyone watching out there. Yeah, and welcome to Power Women, and thank you very much for welcoming us here in your building. Yes, and thank you for <laughs> thank you for accommodating our request to have the shoot here. Yes, of course, of course. Okay, um, as I said earlier, you were once a journalist. Yes. In fact, you were with the Freeman. Yes, I was a <laughs> reporter covering. You were saying? Yes, I was saying. Um, I was a reporter with the Freeman covering the courts or the justice beat. So that was about a year immediately after graduation. So I was. Uh, what was that then still the Palace of Justice, which yes. is no, no longer among the No longer, yeah. Yes. The Marcelo uh, Fernand. The Marcelo Fernand Palace of Justice. Capital grounds. Behind uh, the, the provincial capital, yes. right? And you would uh, walk around those four flights of stairs every day. Correct. To look for news. <laughs> yes. I remember. Yes. I remember. <laughs> so it was, it was an exciting, it was a different, uh, of course, it was a different uh, chapter of my life. It was an mm -hmm. exciting job. The adrenaline. Uh, the rush of the everyday find, trying to find a story and trying to find something to write. Sometimes you'd have like five or six stories a day to finish Correct. by the time of deadlines. It, just, it was definitely interesting and uh, you learned But your undergrad, you actually studied mass communication, mass communication in UP, at yes. the University of the Philippines. So yes. it was a natural course for you to go into newspaper work or journalism. Yes, at that time um, UP was, was uh, known for mostly a training ground for journalists. Our mm. course, our curriculum is very journalism and writing based. So yes, it was a natural progression. Also, most of my um, professors were like, see, Noel Pangilinan was mm. editor-in-chief then of the Freeman and Shiking Charis of Sunstar. So yeah. you had all those influences um, going through college. So naturally, you would, you would kind of go towards the journalism route. The justice beat mm -hmm. is something that not all neophyte journalists would <laughs> choose to cover yes um, well it wasn't a choice <laughs> it wasn't really a choice um you were you were assigned a beat when you get yeah. in um yes because it is very it's highly technical the, yes. the legalese the jargon um and it wasn't just the courts you were as well with nbi and, mm. and the ombudsman and right. a lot of those the pleadings itself having to read like what's that m multiple pa multiple yeah. pages of pleadings by the time in time to write a story at 6 p.m. is is quite uh, challenging. It can be overwhelming yes. reading all those pleadings. I can yes. relate, of course, because <laughs> like you, yeah, I also cover yeah. the justice beat, and yeah. like you, it was also my first assignment. Mm -hmm. But technically, my second, the first was the provincial government, only for a week, mm -hmm. and then it was moved to the back to the Palace to of Justice Palace. for about seven years. Wow! For about seven <laughs> years. Tell me about your unforgettable um, story. Unforgettable stories you covered. Um, I think going towards the end, we covered uh, the promulgation. Sorry, that's going legally again. Or the the reading of the sentence mm -hmm. of the Chong Seven, right? Uh, these were the this is a Pakula Yaga case. So that was one of the the big stories that we covered. Um, I think the day before uh, uh, the sentencing or the day in court, our editor then told us that we had to go inside BBRC mm -hmm. and get the story of. The, the the seven accused mm. um, it was interesting in a sense that you get a different perspective because of course all the all the conversation outside was of course siding with the victim right mm. and and getting the story of the victim but on the other hand when you get to talk to the uh, the people on the other side you also you also find a different perspective and of course the experience itself of going inside BBRC I thought then coming in when we got the assignment um, you know what you see in movies yeah. when there's like you go out to a, a place where there's a table and you get to talk or there's at least that glass um you know the, the glass window then that separates yeah. you but apparently it's not that way here not you have the case to, in the philippines yes <laughs> so when we when we got in and we told the 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 warden then that we wanted to interview them he said he said ah okay 
okay? And we didn't know what that meant. You had to go inside where the inmates were and there was no jail guards around. It's basically you in the middle of all these men in this very crowded um, jail cell. And there was like this small bench right in the middle and it was me and my, my, my fellow reporter. And you're literally shaking in, in the middle of the jail cell doing the whole interview. Changed your life. Yes, and then there was there was even a point where I think there were a couple of there was like a little um, a little incident going on behind us. Oh, I see. Yes. Inside the jail. Inside jail, the cell, sorry. and and the one I was interviewing was just saying, just don't move, just, <laughs> just freeze, <laughs> and don't move. But they apparently they have senior inmates inside who uh, are armed with um, wooden sticks to break up fights or something. They're so-called supervisors. Yes, yes. Let me backtrack a bit. So how did you manage to understand the process, the system, when covering the justice beat? Because of course, when you cover the justice mm -hmm. beat, you have to understand the legal system, how things work, for example. Yes. How, how did you manage to understand the system? Um, a lot of it I am thankful for also is um, the colleagues from the different media outlets also. It's, it's like a group to beat. Mm. The beat reporters, I think the senior ones helped me understand the process as well. Um, I like the camaraderie that there is here in the in the Cebu journalism industry, right? Um, even there, even though there is a bit of a competition in terms of getting the story, but in a way they still help each other out, especially mm. the senior ones in the beat. Um, while writing as well, my editor then would always say when when I turned in a story and they talked about the temporary restraining order or uh, whatever and then he would come back to me and he says what does this word mean and, and I try Correct, to explain yeah. and he says well then write that mm. <laughs> don't give me legalese because the people who are reading it will not understand as well right. yeah. um, because there's always a temptation yes. to write the way it's being it's written being in written. pleadings yeah. exactly um, and then the internet then wasn't oh my god and I'm showing my age <laughs> <laughs> wasn't that that easily accessible as it is now you can't yeah as easily Google, you don't have um, as much resources as you do now yeah. to look to look these up. Um, I remember when I was starting out, mm -hmm. we only had one computer monitor in the newsroom that has internet. Yes, <laughs> yes, <laughs> and then you had to log in. Yes. Uh, oh my God, that is that is a fun times. <laughs> it was different. So uh, and so moving on to that, um, to understand part of me. Um, well then, I guess the easiest solution for me was to go to law school, <laughs> which, mm. which um, I did, initially I did not have any intention of becoming a lawyer, but um, I like I wanted to understand the process. So I don't know how logical that was that I had to go through four years of law school <laughs> just to understand the process, which I could just easily Google now. Yeah. But eventually to leave the profession. <laughs> Yes, actually, I, I, when I was already in, in, in law school, I was already working here for Super mm. Holdings. But um, I think the process of the law itself, understanding the laws and the, the logic behind the reason, is, is helpful in any, in any industry or any situation you're in. Mm. So it, it still is helpful where I am today. Um, in fact, um, quite a few times at work, I'm able to use it. So it's nice to be able to have that knowledge still with you. Were there uh, other motivations aside from understanding the system for your work in, in, in journalism? At the back of your head, do you ever want to be a lawyer? No, no, no. Um, until now, in fact, I'm not practicing as a lawyer. I just, for me, it's just an in interesting process to how these laws link together when you get to understand, you know, what, what the idea is. Mm. For me, I find that interesting. Finding how things work uh, gets me, you know, gets me to a high when I understand that. So um, that was the motivation, I guess. And as you progress, um, you have a clearer view, a clearer view of society, even in general, and, and how government works, how society works. So that for me was was the motivation itself, uh, a clearer understanding of, of the society where you operate. It's very interesting because I've always thought that those. Who go into law school would always want to be arguing in front of a judge no. but when we were talking earlier yes. <laughs> you mentioned you never wanted to do litigation no. in court no i would i would probably be terrified or you know um facing being in court as i said because um naturally i think i am uh, i don't like confrontation 
I don't I don't want to um, I'm not a very confrontational person I think I am extroverted because of my work but <laughs> um, naturally I'm an introvert so um, I would do pleadings if, if I were to practice I would do pleading I would probably do corporate work but um, as to like criminal um, you know um, confrontation criminal litigation Sure, I this that. despite your experience covering the Justice League. Yes. <laughs> or that what, especially was because that, or, of my, I was about to say, or was yes. that eye opening for you? Yes, because um part of the stories that we covered of course were like um, parasite cases or rape yeah. cases and things like that. And and the some I would think there is an emotional side of you that comes out. Uh, even if you were supposed to be an impartial observer as a reporter, that still comes out when you write the story. You're so human. Exactly. So um, I think I admire the lawyers who are able to mask that and still continue with a, especially like, for example, if you're defending an accused or something, right? There has to be some certain um, detachment that mm. you should have. Um, I admire that, but I don't think, I, I'm not sure I could do that. <laughs> But yet, uh, you passed the bar, and then uh, you're here. Thankfully, thankfully I did. <laughs> Since it's Women's Month, I'd like to ask you uh, mm -hmm. what your idea of a modern Cebuan or Filipina is. What is a woman of today? Because um, in your case, mm -hmm. I believe you are one of the modern um, examples of a modern mm -hmm. woman. Thank you. Not afraid to make choices. Yes, I think the modern woman of today, I think it, it's uh, basically being able to say what you want and being able to do what you want um, regardless of not well not necessarily regardless but not being bound of what other people think right you have your own um, frame frame of mind you know your moral compass of what is right and what is wrong but you're not necessarily governed but by thinking that ah, baka sa beginning, ano na ganito, baka mm. ganyan. so sometimes that limits what you want to do and what you think you're supposed to do um, as long as you're confident enough that what you're doing is right and, and what you know what you want to do, I think that is a description not only of a modern woman but a modern individual as a whole, not to be limited by uh, what what other people are saying or expectations. Yes, expectations. And just going towards the goal that you want. When you decided to go into law school, was it your own personal decision? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Although there was a bit of I don't know if it was peer pressure or just like joining the crowd because um, at that time. Also, a lot of my friends, mm. we had a group. I think we were also all reporters taking the oh, exam really? as well. <laughs> yes. Um, so um, it was, you know, this this is this sounds fun. Let's take the exam. <laughs> so it was partly that. But yes, my, my parents never never um, pressured me to go into law school or anything. And then later on, I found out that apparently um, being a journalist, one, being a journalist and being a lawyer were, were, were part of the dreams of my mom but she never oh, told me this before you made it happen <laughs> yeah. for her. Like, I hope so unconsciously. unconsciously I never knew but that was that was years later that I found out yeah you brought your knowledge uh, of the law mm -hmm. to the corporate world yes. and now you you function as the corporate communications manager of Cebu Holdings yes um, can you please tell us what your job entails uh, what exactly is your role in the company Basically smiling a lot. <laughs> I kid that De I <laughs> dealing with kulit uh, media. <laughs> kulit reporters, yeah. I, I I often joke that I am the official uh, GRO. <laughs> um, but yes, uh, it's basically media handling, um, communications of the company as well. Not only in terms of media, but mm -hmm. also um, other groups that the, the company deals with. Um, sometimes uh, even dealing with. Uh, Say, for example, the Chamber of Commerce mm -hmm. or um, um, the, what is the, the consulates and the embassies and things mm -hmm. like that. So, anything that has to do with corporate branding and then corporate uh, communicating what the company has to say and the messaging that the company has towards the public. Mm -hmm. And even internally with employees, that's also a part of it. Cebu Holdings Incorporated is a subsidiary of Ayala Land, yes. which uh, manages yes. one uh, Cebu Business Park. Cebu Business Park and Cebu ID Park. So, uh, so we developed it and we're currently operating because most of the lots also, of course, are being owned now. They were um, uh, bought by other, devel uh, other developers or other companies and they mm. built their own buildings. But now we are basically off operating the whole park so that Cebu Business Park, Cebu ID Park over there in the Oak. Mm. Um, we have 
two new developments now, one in Subang de Kumandawe, that's Gatewalk Central, that will also have an Ayala Mall over there. Mm. Um, and then we just launched last year Seagrove, which is in Matan across uh, Shangri-La. So it's a, it's a 14 hectare complex, which will be more of a eco-leisure concept. So that's a different concept we're bringing in as well. Huge tasks ahead. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and we're right smack, uh, talking right smack in the middle of the Cebu Business Park. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so you seem to be a very independent woman. Making your own decisions, uh, making career shifts, mm -hmm. and being happy about those decisions. Uh, where do these values come from? Um, well, I guess it's just the way that you were brought up. I think um, we were brought up to be more of independent thinkers. You know, mm -hmm. We, um, our parents, we we weren't very much well off growing up, but I think. Um, it was a priority for my parents that we had a good education growing up. So um, I think coming from that and and, and um, there was always, we were not discouraged to talk about what we thought at mm -hmm. home. So I think that's part of it as well. I looked into uh, the company profile mm -hmm. and one of the core values of Cebu Holdings Incorporated is equality. Yes. Among uh, the members yes. of, the, of the company. Yes. How is the relationship between the men and women in Cebu Holdings? <laughs> well, actually, if, if you would look at our What's current... What's the dynamic? Yeah, if you would look at the current headcount, there are, in fact, more women, I think, in the company right now than there are men. Um, so, the dynamic... I like the dynamics of the company. In fact, I would say I've stayed this long here. Um, part of it is because of the people I work with. There isn't... There isn't any distinction whether you're a man or a woman, um, and and people just help each other out. So it's it's a very nice dynamic here. And in fact, you toured our office earlier. Um, we recently moved, not recently, but say a year ago, we moved into this new office, which is more um an open open space type of concept. So um, uh, people are free to collaborate and interact with each other in mm. this setup. I'd like to correct myself because the, the specific um, core value actually mm -hmm. that I was talking about mm -hmm. is empowerment, empowerment of people. Mm -hmm. Yes. How are, since it's Women's Month, who are the women empowered in well, civil buildings? I don't think it, it, it singles out women in general. I mean, yes. it's, people, it's people in general. Um, I think we are empowered to make our own decisions within our sphere, within our own departments, mm -hmm. right? Um, they trust you enough that you are the expert in your field, right? So for example, I'm hired as corporate communication, so they trust me enough to do decisions in terms of, you know, what, what is my scope. Uh, so, and then, and then you're also allowed to make program, you know, they, they encourage you to make your own programs and initiatives, which you think would be better, would be better in terms of results for the company. So that in itself, they're not, they don't, they don't have their, you know, they're not always at your shoulder watching what you do. As long as you deliver the results that they ask you at the end of the year, then it should be okay. Merit-based. Yes. Competence. <laughs> yes, definitely. So far, what has been the biggest challenge in your role as corporate communications manager? <laughs> Aside from, of course, dealing with the press. <laughs> <laughs> no, dealing with the press, I think, is not necessarily a challenge. It is the job. It mm. is the job. And I'm just thankful, of course, coming from um, the industry itself, the journalism industry, that you have an understanding of what journalists need and um, you know how to adjust so that you can fit their needs and at the same time most of the people covering me are either my friends or were my students before mm -hmm. so I think there is that rapport versus dealing with someone who's totally a stranger um, from the industry itself so I don't view it as a challenge it's 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 just part of the job um, and I like that I'm able to interact with friends I you know who I used to who I dealt with when I was still a reporter. Now, going back to your question, um, ah, there have been quite a few in recent years. So yes, it's uh, certain crisis situations that, that happen and happened with the company. I think fairly recently we had one in January. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it's more of uh, 
the daily stress level, and that was a prolonged situation. Right? For the benefit of yes. our viewers who may not have um, an idea, yes, if they if they were not aware of what <laughs> happened in January, which is highly unlikely, which is highly unlikely, <laughs> but to refresh their memory, yes. Um, this is the fire that happened in the Metro Department store here within uh, Ayala Center, Cebu. Um, so that went on for like 60, three to four days. 66 hours or yeah. something like that, almost three days. Um, so uh, although Metro is, is a separate building from Ayala Center and the mall itself wasn't burned, but of course, you know, it was with, you know, within the Cebu Business Park and yeah. the complex. So, I think it was challenging in a sense that it went on for more than a day. It was a long-running um, situation. So, uh, and there was no pause. There was no pause. It was continued. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Everyone was exhausted yes. after twenty-four hours. Yes. So um, I didn't go home until the third day. So I was just here the whole time. Um, so I think you're at that level of stress the whole time. I think, and um, also physically. Mm. You're, you're fatigued and also you, while you're also watching the firefighters going on and on and on and like so I think that was one of the biggest challenges that we had specifically what were the why was it exhausting for you it was exhausting because I couldn't well for one I couldn't leave the site because mm. the, also the media was there 24 yes. 7 right <laughs> and I had to be the one to you know to issue the statements and to take care of that um, uh, also, I think just watching the whole situation of something that you've grown up with and and looking at, at the building burning is, is a different experience. It's, a, it's, shall, it, 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 it's emotionally draining as well, looking and, and, and just waiting when it's going to end. Correct. Because definitely, even if you wanted it to be over, you can't do any. You're helpless. Yes. You exactly. simply can't do anything about it. Exactly. And you just let other people do their job. Yeah, exactly. And and part of it, aside from of course our own jobs, is corporate, you know, issuing statements and all, was uh, supporting the firemen and, yeah. and responders on site. So also supplying food and everything. So part of that was also physically challenging for us. Lessons from that experience. Lessons from that experience. Um. I think it's it's just more of teamwork in terms of handling. Uh, we are very fortunate that uh, there is we have a weekly training within the mall um, for evacuation and, and fire drills. So I think part of that helped, uh, which is why uh, there were no casualties or injuries because everyone was safely evacuated out. Um, so I think just strengthening that. Um, and then making sure that all systems work as well. Um, learning from that experience, what else? Uh, crisis handling, just just you know more of um, what do you call this? Uh, tying loose edges and, and what have you. It's just strengthening the whole system in itself. From a corporate mindset, the takeaways from that experience. Uh, I think I like the the idea. You know, I, I was uh, we were talking earlier that um, in terms of brand equity, I'm very thankful that the Cebuano community um, towards the end um, something good came out of it. That we mm. we we saw the equity of the brand in terms of people valuing Ayala as a as an institution, as, as a place to be here. As a part of their lives. As a part of their lives, exactly. We were looking through the Facebook comments and mm. I know every day, part of, which was also part of the stress, people are always asking, when are you gonna open? When are you gonna yeah. open? And or then, are you even gonna <laughs> open again? <laughs> yeah. So uh, coming out with a statement that oof, at eight o'clock every morning before, and, and you know, sometimes people um, get a bit impatient on when we're gonna say it's gonna open, but there is a process going towards that. We have to check with the BFP, we have to check with policies and everything to get to that one sentence, one sentence statement. But at the end, what we realized was was the value we had with the community, with the, the mall had with the community as as being part of their lives. And, and we highly appreciate that, that they missed actually the mall and they missed coming and, and, and how it has become part of, of their everyday life. And, and, and we want to continue to strengthen on that as, as a community, um, to continue building on that relationship as well mm. with the community. Very nice, very mm. nice takeaways. You obviously have accomplished a lot already at a very young age. <laughs> <laughs> 
when you work on something or do something, do you think consciously of your gender as a factor towards success? Not at all, not at all. Um, I, like I said, um, most of my career has been spent here in Cebu Holdings and Ayala, and I do not feel that that distinction or the difference between mm. men and women. Um, we are all empowered in our own ways. Mm. We are respected for our ideas and not for if you're a man or a woman. Mm. So I don't think it has ever been a, a, a what do you call this, an issue in terms of my career. Um, I think in terms of PR industry and it's said it has its advantages and disadvantages, it's just learning how to navigate work through those advantages and disadvantages because I think those are natural um, natural occurrences or natural hazards of, of the job. What's the biggest advantage of being a woman in this industry? Being able to smile and, <laughs> and, and charm your way in a situation because there are times that you can get away with you know the smile sir it's like you know and I don't think a guy can do that so much right it would look really awkward That's true. realities <laughs> reality that is a reality but it's at the same time on a disadvantage point of view um, there are some situations which would seem like a boys club right for example um, SPR a lot of the universal bonding moment is probably say drinking mm. and uh, you know socializing in general um, so it's either you learn how to avoid or you learn how to navigate that situation mm -hmm. because it social you know being part of the social circle is part of the job so you have to learn how to navigate that as well that's right yeah if we may backtrack a bit mm -hmm. how is it being a woman journalist during your time in the field oh. <laughs> that, that was that was even far more um it had it had its disadvantages especially if you're a woman and you're young um Younger, yeah, younger. younger. Um, yes, it, especially charming your way through uh, to get a story. In terms that, I think it was more. Let's say my sources were, um, say, lawyers, judges, even senators and justices, and things. And I think they were more willing to share their knowledge with a young reporter. Mm. I don't know if that is exactly correct, but I felt that. No, mm. na, na, sometimes I would think. Why would they want to talk to it? You know, what this guy is like an accomplished justice of this, and and you would spend hours explaining a certain concept to a twenty-one year old. Why would you spend your time or day? But sometimes you just realize, in their in their years of wisdom, actually um, they're interested to share it with people willing to learn. So um, it was an advantage in that sense, and then you get to understand what process. Male journalists. Uh, can be very aggressive in pursuing stories, mm -hmm. in uh, outscoring other journalists. Mm -hmm. How did you deal with your male counterparts in the field? I think each had its own style, right? So yes, there were some male journalists who were able to get some um, pleadings and documents, right? Um, but then you also had other sources. So if they were, they were able to get the piece of paper, then at the same time, you could talk to the clerk of court and say, well, what is that? <laughs> and then, you know, <laughs> something new or something like that. So I think um, it, it didn't, it wasn't necessarily a matter of gender as it was a matter of individual style and uh, s skill, I guess. Correct. Yes. And competence. Yes. Yeah. I think that's one of the biggest realizations mm -hmm. also personally for me, mm -hmm. at least here in our industry here in Cebu, mm -hmm. it's really based on merit what yes. you can do. Uh, for example, today, at least, we have 95% of our reporters in the premium are female. Why is that? Even here, there's even more female. <laughs> and there, there was a, a shortage point of time men? when all of our editors-in-chief in the three yes. papers in Cebu are female. female. Yes, yes, correct. So it's, it's different, it's definite. Even in our top management committee here, the, it's four women and one 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 man so there is a majority in the sense of, of female leaders um, everywhere nowadays times have definitely changed yes we are far from those times when women were told what to wear when yes. to get married yes. when to have children 
and so on and so forth. Yes. What do you think, despite uh, the positive developments, um, now we have women leaders like yourself mm -hmm. in huge corporations, what do you think women still continue to face today, the challenges that women continue to face? Um, part, of the, let's see, part of the challenges that women continue to face is, say, a bit, still a bit of objectivity, mm. right? That um, sometimes maybe people see that you get to a certain position because of, you know, how not not necessarily in terms of merit or in terms of skill mm. or sometimes uh, people see you in terms of form and not in terms of your function or, or substance right so just in terms of that but I don't think it's it's really highly challenging anymore okay? at least in the corporate in the corporate world um, a lot of it is, is is merit based as well so I don't think it's it's much of a challenge these days anymore Correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, the the industries that you're able to belong to mm -hmm. also allowed you, give you the opportunities to to show your competence and skill. Yes. Uh, as a person and as a as a woman. Yes. Uh, but the Philippines continues to be a largely patriarchal society. Mm -hmm. How do we help with those who don't have opportunities like you have? Be unafraid to speak their mind. Yes, I'm, I think, like, for example, what has nurtured me in this company is more of, like, uh, again, it's like a safe place of allowing you to express ideas and express opinions. Um, I think that's just what we need because um, talking to women on a daily basis, they have the idea, they have the thought, they have the, the, their own opinions, but it's just, there are sometimes maybe people are afraid to say it because, you know, um, I'm just, you know, or even like, I'm just a housewife or something. I, I, my opinion does not matter or something. That kind of mindset, um, I think, should be eliminated because um, as long as you, have, especially now that you have a lot of access to information, um, although it's a matter of filtering, which is correct information yes. and what is not. Um, but if you're able to filter that and get the information you need to form an informed opinion, then um, I think it's a matter of giving confidence to women to be able to speak their minds because I think a female perspective also helps balance out um, mm. is, is a different is adds to the texture of decisions being made and adds to the complexity uh, helps give a wider perspective to whatever decisions are being made you are leading at least your arm in your company mm -hmm. uh, what have you learned about leadership so far and what is leadership for you um, Leadership for me is helping the team move forward, right? Um, empowering the team so that you're all working towards a common goal. Um, not just working on yourself and being the one on top, but more of lifting, you know, um, other members of the organization so that you work better as a, as a collective. It's stronger as a collective when you're working together towards a common goal. So that for me is leadership. Um, not to the point that you strengthen yourself that when you're gone it mm. <laughs> malfunctions or dysfunctions mm. but making sure that when you're gone it actually works uh, it still works even when you're gone right? how do you do that how do you empower the people under you for example well teaching I guess this is a big part of the function um, transferring knowledge to those who are new and not even just within your department but even those outside right? So we even conduct these uh, uh, crisis communication courses with other people in the organization, mm -hmm. um, just in case I'm not there in the first mm -hmm. hour. So like this is how you're supposed to handle. Because a lot of people are afraid of, um, you know, when a microphone is, mm, is thrust yes, in their faces. Correct, correct, so yeah. at least you know that initial holding point or holding statement on how to handle it, so that you don't look bad on camera as well, or mm -hmm. you don't look like you're hiding something. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it's not even a matter of they're, I think they're just afraid that they're going to be misquoted or, you know, the mm. fear of the camera itself. So even those kinds of training, that the organization is well equipped enough to handle certain situations, even when you're not yet around. So um, that kind of transfer of knowledge is, is very important. Very nice. And speaking of transfer of knowledge, mm -hmm. you actually taught. 
Yes. And hopefully we'll return. <laughs> hopefully we'll return. <laughs> to the, you actually taught at the University of the Philippines yes. here in Cebu. I taught uh, PR. Uh, or it was actually during 113. It's more uh, it was corporate communications. So I think there was uh, UP is in a way expanding its curriculum, um, not to be just uh, very journalism intensive, but to um, branch out to other aspects of communications as well, because um, the media industry has greatly transcended over the years, right? So it's not just the newspaper. So now there are other fields that people can, graduates can go into. So mm -hmm. part of that stream was the corporate communication stream. So I taught that for, I cannot remember how many semesters anymore, <laughs> but it was, it was fun. It was interesting talking to the students, giving them actual situations and how it's being handled in the deep world. I think that's what they wanted. They wanted to get actual practitioners. Correct, so yeah, that, which is very important. Yes, yeah. so that you don't just learn the idea from books, but how it's being practiced, in, particularly um, in Cebu um, as well. So coming out from that, I'm happy to see that I have students who are actually into corporate communications mm -hmm. in different companies now and, and meeting them in different circles. It's, it's, it's very fun, although it dates me a lot because they <laughs> never really made it. They don't call me Miss President. <laughs> We've spoken to uh, many other women leaders, and many of them actually have people they look up to. May I ask for yours? Who do you look up to in the well, in your area of um, interest, in your profession, in leadership? In leadership in general, like in the in, in terms of current events now, I think oh my God, it's just, well, it's timing, but it's Holy Week. Uh, I think the Pope has been very. Um, uh, has been groundbreaking and innovative in terms of the way he's doing things as a pope these days, um, in terms of adapting to what the culture, um, the, the current society. Because um, I think in the past years, um, maybe the way the society has changed, religion has become maybe a bit irrelevant in terms of, mm. not, I wouldn't say irrelevant, but the younger people now are like, cannot relate so much to mm. it because it's a different. You know, too traditional, too traditional in approach, yeah. So I like the way that the Pope has adjusted so that he can reach out I even agree. to yes. the younger generation. I agree. So he's active on social media. Yes, he has well, a Twitter we, account. I follow his least, Twitter yeah, account. Yeah, at least we see his accounts <laughs> yes. on social media. So um, I like leaders who are like that, who are able to adjust and adapt and not just say, no, no, this is, this is the way it's supposed to be. This is the way I know it. Um, reality is it's we don't operate in a vacuum. So you have to consider, you know, how society operates and, and how you will um, work through that through that to get your message across and to get to get your objectives done. Very nice. Yes. Aside from the Pope. Uh, <laughs> do you have any other? <laughs> who else? Who else do I know? Women leaders, for example. Women or leaders. Not necessarily leaders, but women who continue to inspire you in your work. This is gonna be so political. <laughs> I don't want to become political in this interview. Yeah, but we, we will not have to be discussing <laughs> politics necessarily. Um, hmm. Here in the Philippines, let's see. Who else? This is uh, the problem. Is a lot of the prominent figures now uh, that you see is uh, kind of goes towards the political mm. political trend, right? But hmm. Then I, I then I have a long time pausing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the way that uh, the Chief Justice stands strong in, in mm. her stand in mm. terms of um, protecting the independence of the judiciary is also um, very admirable. Mm. Um, I would not exactly form a, a, an opinion. I don't. I, I wouldn't claim to have enough knowledge about the whole mm. um, situation to be able to form an opinion. But I think um, the judiciary, as a separate branch of government, should be able to stand on its own mm. against um, other political uh, political influences and political mm. forces. So the fact that um, she wants to stand firm in terms of the independence of the judiciary is admirable. Mm. You may or may not like the Chief Justice, yes. but it doesn't change the fact that she's standing ground. Yes. The, I like that she is defending the independence of the institution, which is how it should be. Should be right? the institution. The yes, conversation should be, should be on the institution. Yes, because um, when one branch of government succumbs to another, mm. then that destroys the democratic process. 
I think they should be able to defend their own turfs. Uh, turfs. Yeah. So that you know it still works as it should be. Let me. We'll go to something less, far less political. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're actually going to the UK. Let me bring to a mm -hmm. quote by one of the women of the hour, mm -hmm. Meghan Markle, mm -hmm. who's going to be the future wife of Prince Harry. Yes. She said in one of the events in the UK for, uh, if I'm not mistaken, for also for Women's Month, mm -hmm. she said, women don't need to find a voice. They have a voice. They only need to feel empowered to use it. And people need to be encouraged to listen. Your thoughts? Yes, I agree definitely, and I think um, well, I touched on that partly earlier. Mm. Um, women have their own unique opinions and unique views about certain situations, and I think the kind of opinions they have uh, based on the personality and, and, and their perspective um, is interesting. Should be should be heard because um, it has a different dimension to issues in society today. So I totally agree that. Just making it a safe place for pe for women to be able to encourage them to put their opinions out there um, is very important for our society to grow. The next crucial question is, how do you make the society listen? Um, I think it starts with, well, for w women themselves not mm -hmm. to be afraid, you know. Um, again, not allowing yourself to be limited. Um, by traditional, what the traditional, the boundaries the traditional society has set, breaking those boundaries, um, and for institutions or corporations, you know, to give more opportunities to women to speak out and to be part of the conversation and to be part of decision making, I think that that would that would help a lot. Very yes. nice, Attorney Hapsan, your message to the women. And to the men. <laughs> <laughs> to the women and to the men. I think individuals as a whole. Um, I think for our society to progress um, is just to be able to form inf informed opinions, right? Mm. Um, educate yourself enough so that you are able to speak about a certain topic and to formulate an opinion about a certain topic, but at the same time um, be able to respect the opinion of someone who is different from your own. So I think it's that, um, education and respect for, for fellow, uh, for everyone out there. So if we have a society based on that, a society is, uh, which is, you know, um, thirsty for knowledge, mm. correct knowledge, and um, sharing opinions and respecting each other's opinions, I think we would go a long way. I think that's one of the biggest challenges yes. now, particularly our generation. Yes. <laughs> On social media, yes. how do we respect each other's opinion? Exactly, <laughs> I understand because right now, like we we talked about earlier, there are a lot of sources of information today uh, with the internet. Uh, but I think we have to learn how to filter, and at the same time, so, sometimes you get inflamed by what other mm. people write. Is also, you know, again, respect and controlling, you know, how you react to certain uh, certain. Um, things that you read at the end of the day what I always tell my, told my students was think before you play you yes. know sometimes it 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 triggers a certain reaction with you and then you're on your keyboard right? that's right that's right no you have to you know think that whatever you put out there is going to be permanent even if you delete it somebody's probably done a screenshot mm. or something or you have a digital footprint of whatever yes. you said online so just to be careful in terms of that that Digital, the digital world has kind of blurred um, human relationship in a sense, right? People are more um, bold, are more um, uh, reaction. What's the word reactionary? <laughs> are more reactive online because because of the anonymity of it all. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think people should differentiate between your online personality and mm -hmm. who you are um, in person, right? Yeah. The way you act in person. You I should. Agree. It should be the same person because um, that's where it blurs. Eh? It, it you are more embold you're more emboldened by the anonymity mm. of of the internet, and then you get to say things that you're not supposed to be saying in person. Right. And you're, yeah. so I think you know people should just be a bit more aware of that. Mm. Um, the respect and uh, the you know the common courtesy um, should still be practiced even when you are online. Since we're already talking about social media, I might as well press your mind a little bit further. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because I think the challenge is that 
for us not to be overtaken or not to let technology command our own psyche mm -hmm. and mindset because social media for one is spurred uh, primarily by emotion mm -hmm. that's why people can be very emotional yes. on social media but the challenge is as you said earlier just to actually think and pause for a while before posting anything yes. or reacting into something um, how do you think we can do that these days um the pause yes how do we how do we cultivate the culture of control when we are online because um, a lot of a lot of the reactions sometimes even the the behavior online actually mm. transcends to um, your uh, everyday life now I'm seeing um, some people now who are becoming more impatient because it's not instant speaking of which <laughs> yes. we were talking earlier uh -huh. and we go back to the Metro Ayala fire when we were covering the Metro I just want to share with our audience uh -huh. when we were covering the Metro Ayala fire we had comments from because we were streaming live on mm -hmm. Facebook for two to three hours mm -hmm. and we had comments like why should why were we not using a helicopter <laughs> to get aerial shots why yeah. were we not inside a burning building yeah. why were we speaking English <laughs> when we were covering in Cebu yeah. so of course we have to explain because of course we have audiences even outside the Philippines mm -hmm. Cebuanas there mm -hmm. so being impatient <laughs> yes um, I think also the the internet generation has created a lot of behavioral changes in terms of people, no? in terms of communication. So um, I think we have to yeah, step back. I mean, maybe it could be helpful to um, unplug every now and then and just pause on the things that matter. Like For example, the idea always is um, when I post something or when I react to something, I always think, will this matter a year from now? And if it doesn't, then let it go. I mean, sometimes we put too much importance on issues which don't really matter. Mm -hmm. So I think stepping back and thinking how valuable is this conversation? Will my opinion in it matter? Um, or is what I'm going to say going to be true, going to be respectful of other people's opinions? Stepping back. But um, I admit it's it's quite a, kind of difficult to do, right? Mm -hmm. when, when you're in a spur of the moment um, situation and you want to react right away. But I think people just have to go back to that. No, na, na, the basics. The basics, yes. Na, it's, not a, it's not all in the digital world. It, there was a, a point in time where um, you know, people actually ex respected other people's Correct. opinions and, and thought long and hard before they said anything. Because once you say it, you can't take it back. So I think people just have to realize that. And I think, of course, that, that principle or even policy is very much applicable in the corporate world. Yes, definitely. That's why we have to be very careful about the things we say. Um, sometimes I, I get that people want information right away in terms of, uh, uh, for example, things that they want to know about us, our company, and our projects. But again, there is also a long process of, of clearing those um, uh, statements and clearing mm -hmm. those because of the implications of certain that certain statements have. So. Um, again, it's it's the the, the I don't know if the, the word is impatience, but you know a value of understanding that it's not just a matter of saying something. What you're saying has to mean something, and you you have to be able to stand by what you say. So that's why we have to be very careful about things that we say. Very nice, very nice takeaway. Earlier, we asked you to give a message to the women. Mm -hmm. Your message to the men. <laughs> message to the men. Yes. Uh, why are there so few of them already? <laughs> uh, message to the men. I think, um, thank, I wouldn't say thank you, but um, I agree that these days um, opportunities are already equal between men and women. I think, again, going back to the concept of respect. You know, it's just a matter of respect between women, respect between colleagues. Um, just that, not the, the value of, of that. Uh, if you have women who are afraid to speak out, encourage them to speak out and, and, and you know listen to what they have to say because you never know, you know, that might be it might be more interesting than you than you would have thought it was it it, it was. So um, just listen, right? And um, give them the opportunity to speak. 
And of course, we will. We should always continue the conversation. Yes, yes. <laughs> Even if you're already shouting at the top of your lungs, but you're at least conversing still, <laughs> it still helps. Attorney yes. Hapsong, thank you very yes. much for this chance to speak with you mm -hmm. today, for bringing you out of your work for a little while. <laughs> okay. thank, thank you very, you very much. much. Happy Women's Happy Month Women's to you. <laughs> there you have it, our guest in today's edition of Power Women, Attorney Jeanette Hapsong. She is the Corporate Communications Manager of Cebu Holdings Incorporated, the subsidiary of Ayala Land. She was a former journalist, turned lawyer, and now corporate communications professional. Thank you very much for joining us today here in Power Women and join us again in our next edition as we continue to pay tribute to women who are not afraid to make a difference. I'm Joe Berth Okao, online editor of The Freeman. Thanks for joining us. Join us again next time here on The Freeman Conversations. <laughs>